This is the eighth in a series of messages which are designed to give you an overview of the Holy Bible. One of the things that we have tried to avoid in this series is the communication of the idea that by memorizing books of the Bible or certain passages of Scripture you could actually come to know the Bible. In reality, the message of the Bible is something that must be lived out in every individual life. It's not so much memorizing certain details as living the right kind of a life. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, Titus was told, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, I don't know what particular denomination you go to, but a lot of times sound doctrine is defined differently depending upon the denomination that we're involved in. But sound doctrine in the language of Scripture involves interpersonal relationships. It involves the way the old men are to behave and the young men are to behave. It involves how the old women are to behave and how they are to teach the young women to be sober and chaste and good and kind and obedient to their own husbands. It involves how slaves are to treat their masters and masters are to treat their slaves. It involves relationships. The very nature of sin is to cause us to be selfish. The very nature of Jesus is to cause us to be selfless. Back in the early days, of our, our existence on earth when Adam and Eve existed in the Garden of Eden, they were naked and unashamed. They didn't even know they were naked because they were so concerned about each other. But once they sinned, they began to be concerned about themselves. And they realized for the first time that they were naked. And they tried to clothe themselves. And they became concerned about how they appeared. The very essence of Christianity is to cause us to crucify ourselves and to live for Jesus Christ. In our last lesson, we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to help us to accomplish this. For many years in my Christian life, I thought that one of the best things I could do to help people to become like Jesus was to present them with the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. And the Bible teaches that a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. How vividly I recall an instance many years ago in South Bend, Indiana, when I was quoting from memory, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, trying to get the people to be like Jesus, that verse goes like this, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. At that juncture, something dawned upon me that I had never seen before, and I apologized to the audience and said, Would you mind if I quoted that verse again, I think I'm learning something. The Bible teaches, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, not threats, not warnings, but promises, that by these, by these promises we might be partakers of the divine nature, escaping corruption in the world by means of lust or through lust. For example, if I would command you, do not think about lemon pie. Probably you are not thinking about lemon pie until I mention that. And now that I've mentioned it, you probably will find it difficult not to think about lemon pie. Suppose I say to you, now I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and I don't want anyone to think about lemon pie. I don't care if it just came out of the oven. I don't care if it's got meringue two inches tall. I don't care if it's homemade lemon pie. And the crust melts in your mouth. Do not think about lemon pie for the next 30 seconds. Can you not see how self-defeating such a plan is? If you're going to fast with Jesus for 40 days, would it be helpful for someone to preach 40 sermons against food? Would not this have a tendency to stir up all sorts of lust within you until ultimately you would fantasize about food and couldn't help yourself? Well, there is a sense, I think, in which to help you to become like Jesus, to help you to be selfless, to help all of us to be partakers of the divine nature, we need to concentrate not so much upon the threats, but rather upon the promises. So I'm going to give you one of the great and precious promises of the Holy Bible, and I must confess that one of the fears that I have as I present this to you will be that it will be too good to be true. I live in Missouri at this time, and this is called the show-me state. 
I remember some time ago, and I had been receiving a number of phone calls, people offering me things that I really didn't think were bargains at all and thought I was really being taken advantage of. One day a lady called and she said, uh, could you tell me what statue is in New York Harbor? And I said, well, it's the Statue of Liberty. She said, congratulations, you have just won a year subscription to this particular magazine, absolutely free. And I said, you mean I'm not going to have to pay anything? She said, well, you'll have to pay uh, a slight postage fee. I said, well, how much is that? And she said, well, it's only 50 cents a month. I said to her, could you tell me who the first president of the United States of America was? She said, it was George Washington. I said, congratulations, you just won it back. You can imagine our surprise when some time later we received another phone call informing us that we had won a brand new deep freeze. And I said, you mean it's not going to cost us anything? They said, no, your wife signed a little card at a uh, grand opening and you won this deep freeze. And we could hardly believe it. And it was difficult for this person to communicate to us that we had actually won something for nothing that wasn't going to cost us anything. And that's the thing which the apostles had difficulty with as they preached the gospel throughout their world. Who hath believed our report, said Isaiah as it was quoted by Paul in the Roman letter. It was just too good to be true. Now, as a scriptural text, I would like to direct your attention to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. This is a quotation from the 32nd Psalm, and it deals with the forgiveness which David enjoyed. David described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. That's Romans chapter 4 and verse 6, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now the concept of covering was very basic to the Hebrew idea of forgiveness. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and realized that they were naked, they tried to cover themselves. They sewed together aprons made of fig leaves. But man's attempt to cover himself is always inadequate. Our righteousness, the scriptures teach, are like filthy rags. And so God performed the first animal sacrifices and prepared coats of skins that he might cover Adam and Eve. Now that's the basic idea which the Hebrews carried all throughout their history. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word for forgiveness is kafar. Transliterated into the English language, it's spelled K-A-P-H-A-R, and it basically means to cover. So blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now the word impute is the Greek word logizomai, which means to reckon or charge. It's like a charge card that you may have to use in a department store. You go into the store and you get certain items which you need and then instead of paying for them, you charge them. Occasionally someone will loan you a charge card, but of course you need to be very careful about the individual you might loan your charge card to because if they are irresponsible, they could certainly take advantage of you. And God does not allow anyone into his family that has not been born again. We have to be born from above in order to experience the blessedness spoken of in Romans chapter 4 and verse 8. Blessed is the man, the scriptures teach, to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That is, we make mistakes, we do things that are wrong, but God doesn't charge us for that. Now. Let me share with you this artist's conception of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments compose the covenant of God which he gave to his people at Mount Sinai. And it was not a covenant intended to bring salvation to man at all. It was a covenant intended to show us that we were sinners. And in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26, the scriptures teach that the first five books of the Bible were written actually as a witness against us. And the tablets of the testimony, the Ten Commandments, actually condemn everyone. The first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
Sometimes a theater marquee will put who is the star of a certain motion picture, and you don't watch the picture very long until you find out who the star is. I suppose there is a sense in which each of us have a marquee displaying who's starring in our own lives. It's supposed to be God, but seldom is. There's another of the Ten Commandments which says, Honor your father and your mother. Who can say that he has always honored his father and his mother as he should have? There's another commandment which says, Thou shalt not covet anything which is thy neighbor's. So we're sinners. And the Ten Commandments point out our sins. The Ten Commandments were placed in this receptacle, which was called the Ark of the Covenant. It was made of shittim wood and enclosed with pure gold. On top of the Ark were two winged angelic creatures, which are called cherubim. We meet them in the early chapters of our Bible at the gate of the garden. The Bible teaches they had flaming sword and were turning every way to keep man from the precincts of the tree of life. Therefore, there is a sense in which these individuals were the watchmen of God, pointing out our sins and keeping unworthy individuals from the presence of God. And so the cherubim were on top of the Ark of the Covenant with their faces looking inward toward the Ten Commandments, but they didn't see the Ten Commandments because there was a covering, separating them from the Ten Commandments. This covering was called the mercy seat. Now, in the language of Scripture, Jesus is our mercy seat. He is the propitiation for our sins. That's the, the, the Greek word for propitiation is equivalent to the Hebrew word for covering or atonement. You remember in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, Mary was looking for him in the garden and couldn't find him. The stone was rolled away and Jesus was not there. And stooping down, she looked inside the sepulcher where Jesus had been, and she saw, not Jesus, but she saw two angels sitting where Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the feet of the place where Jesus had been. And John, the apostle, was at this time just coming to grips with the resurrection of Jesus. He didn't know up to this point that Jesus was really going to be raised from the dead. And all of a sudden, the pieces of the puzzle came together. And he wrote later on, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, if you will keep in mind this concept of forgiveness given to us in the Holy Bible and exemplified in the life of Jesus Christ, you're going to understand, or you will come nearer understanding, I think, the fourth chapter of the book of Romans in verse 8, which teaches... Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, we commit the sin. I tell people frequently when they become Christians, that doesn't mean you'll make a hundred on every test. That doesn't mean you won't need an eraser on the end of your pencil. That doesn't mean that you're never, ever going to have a wreck with your automobile or make a mistake in your household or domestic duties. All it means is that God, looking down as the cherubim do, all God sees is Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ, not your sins, not my sins, not our imperfections, but only Jesus. Now, let me give you a personal testimony. When I became a Christian, I somehow believed that being baptized into the death of Christ, I contacted the blood of Jesus, and I really believe that all of my past sins were forgiven and were forgotten by God. But I was having some real difficulty with my present sins. Every day of my life I would see something else in my nature which was not like it should be. And I was suffering from a great deal of guilt. I knew that God hates all the workers of iniquity and I saw iniquity in my own life. I knew that sins have a tendency to separate us from God and iniquity hides our face from Him hides his face from us, rather, so that he will not hear. And I began to be concerned about my own relationship with God. 
And as long as I looked at myself, I was never sure whether I was saved or not. And then this truth, these exceeding great and precious promises of God began to come clear to me. I began to see them for the first time in my life. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible teaches, there is therefore now, how much condemnation? No condemnation. Now, if I commit one sin today and that sin goes on my record, I am really just as guilty of as, as if I committed all sorts of sins. The scriptures teach, whoever keeps the whole law and offends in one point is guilty of it all. So you can't have it both ways. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're either under the covering. You're either under the covering of Jesus Christ or you are outside the covering of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are in Christ, the scriptures categorically promise there is no condemnation, absolutely none. You say, that's a shocking truth. It's just hard to believe. And as I said earlier, it is almost too good to be true. And so you may say, well, is that taught anywhere else in the Bible? And of course it is. In the book of Ephesians and the fifth chapter, there's a very famous verse which husbands like to quote to wives, and also wives have some favorite texts which they like to quote to husbands out of this passage in the Bible. But in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, the scriptures teach, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Question, when? You say, I believe that. I believe the church will be holy when God presents it to himself, but when? Some have thought, well, perhaps we die as sinners, and after we are dead for some time, something happens which purges us of our old sins and causes us to be acceptable to God. That's really not a biblical concept at all. The biblical concept is that right now, if you are in Christ, you are, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, without a spot or a wrinkle or anything like that. Or as he wrote to the Romans, you have absolutely no condemnation. Why? You say, I sinned today. And the Bible teaches if we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth isn't in us. We sinned not only before we became Christians, but we sinned after we become Christians too. But you see, in Christ, there is no condemnation. We're not even charged with a sin. God looking down, as the cherubim looked down, sees only the righteousness of Christ, not our blemishes, faults, and imperfections. The same truth is taught in the Colossian letter. Now, in chapter 1 of the book of Colossians, beginning with verse 21, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith. Now, it is important that you remain in Christ just as you chose to enter Christ by your own free will and volition. You have the option of leaving Christ but as long as you remain in Christ, there is no condemnation to you. In the book of Jude and the 24th verse, there is this beautiful benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and evermore. Now, the quotation from the 32nd Psalm to which we have made reference, which was quoted in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, talks about four different kinds of sins which are atoned for. The Psalm begins, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, that's the first idea, the idea of moving over a boundary where you didn't belong. That's what transgression is. 
whose transgression is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. Uh, excuse me, I missed whose sin is covered in verse 1. The word sin means missing the mark. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. There is another kind of sin which reveals man's unworthiness to be in the presence of the Lord and, whose, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So we have transgression, sin, iniquity, and guile. Four different words all describing different problems which we face in our lives so that none of us are righteous. No, not one. Isaiah said, from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that cannot be bound up nor mollified with ointment. But God in his infinite mercy and grace covers our sin with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The songwriter had it correctly when they wrote, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless, to stand before his throne. But you say, how can this be? It seems too incredible. Well, you see, as we mentioned in our last lesson, God hasn't left us as orphans. He hasn't left us all alone to do this. He has come into our lives and given us a different kind of a nature. So the 32nd Psalm continues, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must, must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. I have a vivid recollection of my uncle. This has been 30 or 40 years ago. He was working with a team of horses, and they were being, they weren't minding at all. Now, my uncle had a big leather strap, and he was whipping these horses, holding on to the reins and trying to make them mind. And God doesn't want to have to do that with you or with me. Don't be like a horse or a mule who do not have any understanding. He said, rather, let me guide you with mine eyes. How's that possible? Well, when you have the right kind of heart. When you're born again, God doesn't have to threaten you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but perfect love casts out fear. And our love for God causes us to love one another. In 1 John chapter 4, notice how this concept of the propitiation associates with our love for others. 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation or the covering for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Marion Phillips Platic wrote this in the Christian Herald. Surely no man can offer to a woman a greater compliment than to ask her to become the companion of his life. And this is the compliment that God in Christ Jesus bestows upon each of us as human creatures. Out of all of the beings which he ever created or might have created, he has chosen us. Out of all the magnificent angels which he could have kept company with, he's chosen to settle down in the give and take of marriage with man. This Lilliputian who actually thinks that because he can build a computer or orbit his tiny planet or write a symphony, that he has the right to thumb his nose at Almighty God. This man who in his female counterpart wastes time instead of using it, while less than 15 miles away Little children lie in squalid beds with no possibility of a good night kiss except the possibility of a rat bite. This man who will shut his ears to the screams of Jewish children and do nothing until his own nation's installations are attacked. We are lazy. We are dull. We are insignificant. We are self-seeking and trivial. Why should the creator of the unimaginable vastness of the universe, why should the creator of the incredible complexity of a, of a molecule, why should the source of all that is perfect and beautiful, why should he look down upon this vain creature and offer to us his name, his honor, and his support forever? 
I do not know. This is the mystery of the Christian faith. It is our prayer that the God of great miracles will work that miracle in your heart and cause you to be like Jesus by the exceeding great and precious promises which he gives us in the Holy Bible.